If I can have your attention, please. We're about to begin this services for Mr. Harvey Fink. We want to welcome all of you here in the chapel as well as everyone on viewing online. Um, just a gentle reminder for those of you present in the chapel, if you have a cell phone with you, please place it in the silent mode or turn it off completely. That would be appreciated. And the shiva will be observed here at the funeral home in the other chapel right across the hallway. Our staff will guide you as the service is over. So again, that's immediately following the service. And the family has requested memorial contributions to Will's Place or to the Navy Marine Corps Relief Society. Um, this information is listed in the service folder as well as on our website. But for those of you here at the chapel, for Will's Place, if you prefer to mail in a contribution, we have envelopes at the front table. Um, either in the lobby or in the shiva room, and you're welcome to take one when you leave this afternoon. The services this afternoon will be conducted by Rabbi Barry Axler. Our Jewish funeral service begins with the Kriya, or tearing the black ribbon. It's a custom that dates back to two biblical moments. First, when Jacob saw what he thought was the blood of Joseph on his coat of many colors, the Bible says that he tore his clothes. And then many years later, when King David learned that his eldest son, Avshalom, had been killed, in his grief he fell to the floor and also tore his clothes. So this expression of tearing has been part of our Jewish service now for over 3,000 years. And the external tearing has come to symbolize the broken fabrics and the broken hearts in our lives. And Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Dayan HaEmet. O blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who is the one judge of all truth. It's the measure of a man. And not how did he die, but how did he live? And not what did he gain, but what did he give? These are the units to measure the worth of a man as a man, regardless of his birth. Not what was his station, but had he a heart? And how did he play his God-given part? Was he ever ready with a word of good cheer to bring back a smile or banish a tear? Not what was his shrine or what was his creed, but had he befriended those really in need? And not what did the sketch in the newspaper say, but how many were sorry when he passed away? <clears throat> he is gone. And you can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love that you shared, 
You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind and be empty and turn your back. Or you could do what he would want, smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. <clears throat> At times like this, words fail us. And so we turn to our Psalms. And if you can, please join me in the 23rd Psalm. <clears throat> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, thou prepares a table before me. <clears throat> Thou anoints my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A life well lived cannot be diminished by death. The beauty, the guidance, and the inspiration it gave us will shine on as brightly as ever. Death leaves a heartache no one can heal, but life leaves a memory no one can steal. There's a beautiful line from the play Wicked, which I found very appropriate to the service today. I know we are who we are today because we knew you. And because we knew you, we are changed forever. Those we love, they remain part of us. Our loved ones leave the world, but never our hearts. Harvey is now a part of who you are, of how you see the world, of how you live and give, and those priceless gifts are yours forever. In describing the passing of our first matriarch, Sarah, or the biblical figure, Joseph, the Bible says that Sarah lived to be 127 years old, and Joseph lived to be 110 years old. And what the Bible doesn't say is that Sarah died, or that Joseph died, but that Sarah lived, and Joseph lived, underscoring that what is most important in life is how we live, and not how we die. Harvey lived a wonderful life of love for his wife, Barbara. He lived a life of love for his children, David and Mary Jane, and Andrew. He lived a life of love for his grandchildren, Ellie, Jack, Aiden, Alex, David, and Jacob. He lived a life of love for his extended family and his many friends. Harvey and Barbara met and married in Hawaii, where he was in the Navy and she was a nurse. And they had a beautiful relationship friendship and marriage for 55 years. Being in the Navy and working on destroyers was always one of Harvey's favorite jobs. While in the Navy, he became an honorary Jewish chaplain. As he loved children, Harvey's other favorite job was as a substitute teacher. He was particularly concerned with both children and adults who had special needs. The family shared with me that Harvey was devoted to the family. He was home every night for dinner at five. Harvey passed away as he lived with his family in his heart. Our tradition teaches us that when we pass on, we leave behind only two things. And they are two Hebrew words that not only sound alike, but they come from the same root. One is Yerusha, and the other is Morisha. Now, Yerusha are your material assets. They're your bank accounts or your real estate holdings or your stocks and bonds. But Morisha is the essence of who you are, are the characteristics about yourself that you leave behind 
for family and friends who love you and who will miss you. I don't know, nor do I care to know, what Harvey Jerusha was. But after being with this wonderful family, I can tell you what his Morris show was. It was an unconditional love for his family. It was a reaching out and caring for others. And it was a tremendous zest for life. You know, we're all familiar with the very first words in the Bible. Let there be light. And there was light. But it wasn't until day four that God creates the sun and the moon. So if God creates the sun and the moon on day four, what was this light that the Bible was talking about in the very first words? So I believe that light was the light of God. And since the world wasn't complete, God put that light into each and every one of us. And when we lead good lives, and when we care for others, that light shines forth and makes this world better. Every single person here knew that Harvey Fink had that light. And when it shone forth and hit you, it inspired you to do better and to be better. On the drive up from the city today, two songs came over the radio that touched me very, very deeply for the service today. One was a song by James Taylor, How Sweet It Is to Being Loved by You. How sweet it was to being loved by Harvey. And the other song was a hit song by Burt Backrack and Hal David and sung by Dion Warwick. Always something there to remind me. Each of you will always have a special thing to remind you of Harvey. A dinner, a moment, a, a trip, whatever. As the song concludes, for how can I forget you? when there is always something there to remind me. I was born to love you, and I will never be free because you'll always be a part of me. I want to share with you the words of Father Michael Judge. Father Judge was a chaplain to the New York City Fire Department, and he perished in 9-11, saving lives. And before he passed away, he wrote a little note to his friends. And he said, hang on to your memories, hang on to your moments, and hang on to each other. Hang on to your memories of Harvey. Hang on to the precious moments that you spent with him. But if I could take a little rabbinic privilege, you're a wonderful family. And the most important gift you can give to Harvey's memory is to hang on to each other. I was very moved by all the things that the family shared with me about Harvey Fink. So I'd like to share with you a very personal and a very special poem whose message I know Harvey would have embraced. It's entitled, If I Knew. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd see you fall asleep, I would tuck you in more tightly and I'd pray the, and I'd pray the Lord your soul to keep. If I knew it would, be, it would be the last time that I'd see you walk out the door, I'd give you a hug and a kiss, and I'd call you back for one more. If I knew it would be the last time that I'd hear your voice lifted up in praise, I would videotape each action and word so I could play them back day after day. If I knew it would be the last time I would be there to share your day, I would not say that you'll have some anymore. I can let just this one slip away. I would not think that there's always tomorrow to make up for an oversight and that we always get a second chance to make everything just right. So just in case today is all I get, I'd like to say how much I love you. And I hope that we never forget that tomorrow is not promised to anyone, young or old alike. And today may be the last chance that you get to hold your loved one tight. So if you're waiting for tomorrow, why not do it today? For if tomorrow never comes, you'll surely regret the day that you didn't take the extra time for a smile, a hug, and a kiss, and you were too busy to grant someone what turned out to be their one last wish. So hold your loved ones close today and whisper in their ear and tell them how much you love them and that you'll always hold them dear. And take time to say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, or it's okay. 
And if tomorrow never comes, you'll have no regrets about today. Harvey's passing cannot diminish the important ways that he touched your lives, and your grief cannot take away the happiness that you shared. In your memories of him, may you find comfort. In your family and friends, may you find love. And in your hearts, may you find the strength to help you through this very difficult time. So may the memory of Harvey Fink always be a blessing to us. May it inspire us to do better and to be better. And in his honor, may God grant you comfort and peace in this very difficult time. Amen. It's now my honor to call upon grandson Alex, who has some thoughts and memories to share with us. Firstly, I want to thank you all for coming. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Wang, and I was Harvey Fink's eldest grandson. My grandfather is survived by many people. He left behind a wife, two children, six grandchildren, and countless friends and acquaintances. Everyone had a different relationship with my grandfather, and some barely had a chance to know him at all. So for those of you who remember the bad more than the good, or who don't remember much of either, I want to tell you who he was to me. I think my first memory of him highlights the uniqueness of our relationship. I was three years old, playing in the tub at his house with a toy scuba diver and a toy shark, and I screamed when the shark caught the diver. My grandfather burst in, afraid I had gotten hurt, and I told him that I was just playing. I'm not blind to my grandfather's faults, and I know that had it been anyone else, he would have been furious at having been startled at something so inane. But instead, he simply explained to me why I shouldn't shout like that, and then let me get back to my bath. For some reason, as short-tempered as he could be, I can count on one hand the number of times he got angry with me. I visited my grandfather a lot when I was little. He'd pick me up from my house, and he'd always play the same cassette tape of children's music to keep me entertained in the car. He'd cut Werther's candies in half for me because they were a choking hazard, and he put my drawings up all over his kitchen. At night, he'd read me Jack and the Beanstalk, and eventually I'd drift off to sleep beside him. When I got older, we'd go to breakfast at Annie's Pancake House, where he knew the owner and one of the waitresses. During the day, I'd play Angry Birds on his iPad, and he'd read or watch TV next to me. For dinner, he'd bring home Dengios or Portillos, or make hamburgers on the grill. He always let me choose, and one day, I asked him what he wanted to eat. He looked me in the eye and said, I want what you want, Alex. For all he expected and demanded of others, with me he was always selfless and compassionate. While eating, we'd talk, and I'd ask questions about his life and the events he'd lived through. And afterwards, we'd go to the chocolate shop ice cream parlor a few blocks from his house. In the evenings, we'd eat popcorn and watch movies together that we'd picked up from the library. And when it was time to go to bed, we'd fall asleep listening to podcasts. He'd visit me too. When I lived in Ohio, he drove all the way out to visit me for my birthday. And on holidays, he'd come over and spend the night. Even though he didn't celebrate Christmas, he'd wake up early with me and be happy that I was happy. And during family get-togethers, when I was too young to talk to the adults and too old to play with the other children, he'd be there and we'd sit together and keep each other company. But as he got older, things started to change. He couldn't eat popcorn anymore. It wasn't safe for his colon. He couldn't drive over to visit. He didn't have the energy. He couldn't be around for the holidays. It was too cold. Before he went to Florida for the first time, he asked me if it was OK if he wasn't here for my birthday. I told him yes, as long as he promised not to forget me. And I gave him a little plastic spoon, which was all I had on me at the time, so that he would remember. My grandfather kept that spoon for the rest of his life. It was in the room with him when he died, and I have it here with me today. But I digress. As he grew weaker and weaker, I became more and more aware how limited my time with him might be. And even before he got sick, each time I said goodbye to him, I worried that it might be the last. And every year when I blew out the candles at my birthday, my wish was that he would be there until the next one. Except for this past birthday, 
when I simply wished for whatever was best for him, which in the end this was. I was fortunate enough to be there when it happened. I held his hand until the moment he passed because I wanted him to know that he wasn't alone and because I knew he would have done the same for me. And I will say now what I said to him then. I love you so much, Poppy, and I am so glad that you got to see me grow up and that we got to know each other. Goodbye, Poppy. Wow, that was so beautiful. Alex, to paraphrase a line from Mary Poppins, he was a spoonful of sugar in your life. And now it's my honor to call upon son David from Boston, who also has some memories to share with us. Thank you all very much for coming here today to honor the life and memory of Harvey Fink. This is a celebration, and to be clear, this gathering and ceremony is for us, Harvey's family and friends. When I asked my father if he had any requests or desires for his funeral, his response was fairly typical. Uh, do whatever you want, what the hell do I care? Uh, my dad uh, was very much about people and family. I've gotten some uh, condolences from afar and people uh, sending their regrets for not being able to be here. If you're online and you're watching this, thank you for being here. Um, my father would much rather you be able to be there with your loved ones and your family. Uh, one of my friends from college wanted to come and couldn't uh, because he was visiting colleges with his son. Uh, my father would much rather you be there with your son. That's who he was. Um, I may be biased, but I think my father was a man worth remembering, and taking time to honor and celebrate his life can both ease our pain and serve to help us learn some lessons from him for the rest of our lives. So I thank you for coming here and helping us do that. Uh, Dad was born here in Chicago to Jack Fink and Lillian Bremen. He was an only child with a fairly traditional upbringing. Uh, I didn't hear much about his early childhood, uh, but when he did remember it, it was to remember it very fondly. I suspect being the only child of Lillian Fink was probably not a bad gig. Um, and he got uh, pretty spoiled, uh, but seemed to grow up into a, a pretty good person despite those, those things. Um, I didn't hear much about his high school escapades. Uh, he seemed to mostly stay inside the lines. Uh, there were a few stolen traffic signs in our basement and some reports of an unauthorized trip to Florida that he took in high school or, or shortly thereafter uh, that was far in excess of anything that I would have tried to pull with my parents, but mostly he seemed like he was a pretty straight shooter. Um, I was surprised when my mother was recalling things and she told me that after high school, dad went off to Purdue. I corrected her and said, no, dad graduated from the University of Illinois. Uh, she let me know that in fact, dad had a false start at per Purdue um, where, like a lot of uh, young, uh, smart folks who had never really left the home, he had a hard time, he didn't go to class, failed out, and was sent home. Um, probably 20 years ago, I would have tried to hide that from you guys and, you know, uh, not thought it was a good thing, but um, today I'll celebrate it with you as my dad knew how to get knocked down and knew how to get back up. Um, and he taught me how to do that. And. Uh, he was a human being with faults and cracks, and, uh, and he learned from them. After dad picked himself back up from, and went to the University of Illinois, he did graduate with a degree in psychology uh, and went on from there to, um, without consulting uh, Jack or Lillian, uh, join the Navy. Um, I would say a small part of this was trying to stay out of the draft and during the Vietnam War, but my dad actually did have a very strong sense of obligation to a country and a sense of obligation to others, and that's where, um, that's where he, he ended up uh, loving the Navy. Um, he went off to officer candidate school, and on graduation from that, probably the second luckiest thing in his life happened, and he was stationed on a destroyer in Oha Oahu. Um, so the kid who grew up in Chicago got to run off to, uh, to Hawaii. 
Um, and that was not bad duty in those days, uh, and he enjoyed it. Um, the first luckiest thing that happened to him uh, was that while there, he met a young nurse uh, who was traveling in Hawaii, uh, Barbara Little. Um, and uh, she was lucky enough that she said yes to date him. Uh, early on in their relationship, he relays a story where he was trying to charm my mother. Uh, he put his uniform on and was gonna take her to the officer's club on the base. And they, coming on the gates, there's a Marine guard that has to stop and salute you, and he thought he would you know, look like the big cheese. Um, much to his surprise, as he's driving on in his little red convertible with his very pretty date, the uh, Marine guard did not actually wave him on. The Marine guard stopped him, and he approached the side car, and he said, sir, are you aware that you have a rake stuck in the grill of your vehicle? <laughs> and uh, um, somehow my dad managed to play that off, and of course, don't you think I put it there? And they went on in, but despite that uh, misstep, um, he managed to woo my mother and get her to continue to date him. Uh, shortly after they were dating, he actually got to spend, uh, he was sent by the Navy to spend three months in Guam. That probably sounds like pretty good duty to you guys, but in fact it was not. There was not much of a social scene in Guam. And um, he <laughs> recalls spending those three months missing my mother intensely. And on returning from those three months, uh, of pretty solitary existence in Guam, he promptly asked my mom to marry him. And he was lucky enough that she said yes. Uh, I do want to take a moment and talk about that marriage. Uh, the older I get, the more I realize that there are as many different ways to have a successful marriage as there are married couples. Uh, and I also realize that there is no perfect marriage. Uh, they all involve a certain amount of compromise and uh, commitment. Uh, I think it is a testament to both Harvey and Barbara uh, that uh, these two young people, uh, one and only child of Jewish parents who grew up in Chicago, uh, one the Lutheran daughter of, with three sisters and two brothers who grew up in a town of 300 people at the time in, in rural Ontario, uh, found a way to build and sustain a lasting marriage. Uh, they could not have had more different backgrounds or personalities. Um, Harvey was great at planning, but he was not great at being flexible. Uh, Barbara rarely planned. Uh, with five siblings, any plan rarely survived more than a few minutes, uh, but she was incred incredibly resilient and never backed down from any challenge. Uh, these two made their way through the many challenges that present themselves in marriage. They moved from Hawaii to Los Angeles to Chicago. They changed jobs multiple times. Uh, they had two children in 11 months, um, which they, once I had kids, I shook my head at many, many times. Um, they helped one of their young children through some complex medical issues, um, and they dealt with my father's illness. Uh, somehow they always found a way to compromise uh, and remain committed to each other. Uh, I can attest to the fact that there was some yelling, um, and there were hard times but there was always love, and there was always an ability to compromise, and ultimately two people who cared more about each other than any particular crisis of the moment. Uh, and at the risk of sounding unromantic, I don't think their marriage survived because they were star-crossed lovers who were destined for each other. Um, I think their marriage survived and thrived because they're both good people without a selfish bone in their body. Uh, and were both capable of putting the needs of their partners and of their family above their own. And my sister and I benefited greatly from their love and from that example. So thank you, Dad, and thank you, Mom, for that. Not long after getting married, Harvey left the Navy, and they moved back to Chicago and started working. Uh, Dad started working for the family business, the uh, FNG Electrical Supply. Um, I have to say Dad probably been better suited to staying in the Navy, uh, he enjoyed its black and white rules and regulations uh, than the sometimes challenging world he found at F&G. But my father really wanted to be present for his kids and he wanted to be home every night for dinner. Um, and his life has been marked by uh, multiple uh, profound sacrifices for his children. Uh, not the least of which was this decision uh, to change his career and do something that maybe not was as fulfilling to him personally 
uh, but was the best thing for his family. And he was home every night uh, to mentor and teach us. Uh, and you know, through his actions, he showed us what he thought we were worth um, and what he thought family was worth. So I think my father could have been a great naval officer. I think he could have had a lot of success if he had stuck with that. And if, I think if you gave him his life to do over 100 times, 100 times he'd choose what he did, and he'd be home with my sister and I, and he would have been the best dad he could. Um, in that time, uh, Harvey and Barbara first welcomed my sister Mary Jane. And um, I don't think anybody's going to be surprised to hear that uh, in an unplanned event, I was born 11 months later. Uh, one of my favorite stories is that when my mother tells me that when she found out she was pregnant with me, you could imagine with a you know three or four month at hold, she sat at a table and cried for a day. Um, but in this happy little surprise, Barbara got to see that in fact she had made a good choice here. Harvey, who loved to plan and who wasn't always that flexible, truly loved being a father. Um, he loved to teach and he could explain the most complex ideas in ways that were digestible to young minds. And it was really clear that he genuinely enjoyed doing that. Midlife was kind of an interesting time for my dad. Uh, it saw a change in career after the family business was sold. Um, it saw him doing some exploring. My father, for those of you who may not have known every aspect of my dad, during this time my dad went skydiving. Not something a lot of Jewish kids from Chicago did. Uh, my father decided to run a marathon, and he did that. He ran the Chicago Marathon. Um, I don't think he set the, the time, uh, the record for the course, but uh, he, he did complete it. And uh, he spent three weeks uh, trekking around the canyon lands of the Southwest with his Outward Bound group, and he learned a lot about himself and the world. Um, I have complicated uh, memories of my dad during this time. He was some, caught somewhere between being a, a hippie from the 70s and 60s and 70s on a journey to experience the world on, on its own terms, uh, a only child who had a mild to moderate case of OCD, um, who was not always the most flexible guy in the room, um, but uh, was smart enough to uh, plan things out well enough that usually he didn't have to deal with any small crises. Um, and, uh, and at his best, he was a teacher who encouraged his children to push themselves and their boundaries while providing the safest, most secure safety net of unconditional love and unlimited support. Um, after, after FNG was sold, Dad started a business where he was selling printing back in the 80s and 90s when that was a thing before the internet and when people still had envelopes and calendars and business cards and letterhead, and that's how he made a living. Um, and this was another sort of interesting facet of uh, Harvey's personality that I had not previously seen. Um, I actually saw he was a pretty charming guy and a really good salesman. Um, he was a good salesman because uh, he really enjoyed people and he liked listening to people. And it, you know, when he could listen to them, um, you know, pretty soon they wanted to help him out and they wanted to, he could figure out what they needed and he could provide that. Um, he was a really charming guy and he enjoyed, he enjoyed hearing everyone's stories. And because of that, <clears throat> people liked talking back to him and he maintained a very respectable small business selling printing. Once the internet became a thing, dad saw the writing on the wall and he saw that pretty soon People weren't going to be buying business cards or letterhead or envelopes, and he needed to find a new gig. And at that point, my father surprised me yet again, and he chose to chase a dream he had always had, and he went and became a school teacher. He went to school, got his teaching certificate, and actually started, um, started teaching. Um, he loved teaching, and he loved working with kids. And it was really clear that he felt invigorated during this time of my life, during this time of his life, excuse me. Um, one of my favorite stories of my dad comes from this, this time. Uh, he tells me he was late for a uh, final class for one of his chi early childhood education classes, during which he had to give a sock puppet presentation to some kids. If you can imagine Harvey doing that. Actually, I can, because he loved it. Um, you'll see the picture of my dad. You might see it with him holding a sock puppet with a big uh, 
really big grin on it. Well, my dad was driving to this presentation when he realized that he had forgotten the sock puppets at home. So halfway to the class, the OCD, sign of Harvey, OCD side of Harvey realized his mistake and rather angrily turned around and started speeding home so he could get the puppets. Wouldn't you know it, he got pulled over in Skokie. And here's where this, the charming salesman side of dad stepped in. And as this policeman comes up to his window, my dad rolled his window down and gave him his license and registration. And he said, hey, if I give you an excuse you've never heard before, will you let me go without a ticket? And the guy kind of laughed and he said, I've been doing this for a while, sir, and I doubt you're gonna be able to surprise me, but go ahead, I'm game. So my father said, I have to give a sock puppet presentation to a bunch of kids, and I forgot the puppets at home. And the guy shook his head and said, you have a good day, sir, and he walked away. <laughs> so I think that's why dad's smile is quite that large in that picture you see of him holding that puppet. Dad did go on to get his teaching certificate and began teaching at the high school that my sister and I actually had attended. At age 65, he was relegated mostly to substitute teaching. Um, which was just fine with my dad. He just really liked to be there and teaching the kids. And in fact, he was pretty good at it. Honestly, I think it was his calling. I got another laugh one day when I was home and he was talking to me about school and about what he was teaching. And he says, you know, they call me a lot to teach, to substitute in for the special needs kids. He says, I think, I think they, you know, they like that because we have a pretty good understanding of each other with his with this pretty significant OCD, my father really liked routine. He says, I like to have my routine. These kids do really well in a system where this thing's the same way every day. They like their routine. We see each other, we get along pretty well that way. And I, I had a good laugh at realizing that my father had indeed found a home. And here was a place where, in my opinion, all of the different many Harveys got along and could serve a unified purpose. The hippie guru and Harvey could talk to people about their dreams and encourage kids to dream and stretch and, and, um, and reach for the stars. Uh, the OCD part side of Harvey uh, got to plan things out and make lesson plans and make everything the same for those special needs kids every day. The, the charming Harvey got to sell the kids on the idea of getting an education and the fact that they should be invested in this. He made them feel important, just like he used to be able to do with his clients, just like he used to be able to do with his family, or still did. And he got those students to buy into the idea of getting themselves an education. During this time, uh, the largest contribution to Harvey's happiness uh, came along as well and became a grandfather. First with Alex, not that long after, Jacob and David. Um, and then a little bit after that, Jack, Ellie, and then finally, last but not least, Aiden joined his crew of six. Six young hearts and minds that meant the world to Harvey, or as he had involved into at this stage, Poppy. Dad loved his grandchildren enthusiastically, without reservation. Quite simply, they could not do anything wrong in his eyes. And everything they did was magical and genius to him. Free of the pressures that he had placed on himself as a young father, Harvey could teach and love and support his six grandkids truly unconditionally, and he was a fantastic grandfather. I know Poppy's grandchildren felt that love and know how truly special each one of them is. Unfortunately, Dad's health began to fail, and in his mid to late 70s, he had some pretty significant challenges. And then the last two years were a fairly rapid decline. He was diagnosed with cancer, and despite some amazing care, some really good doctors, and the world's best nurse at his side, uh, taking great care of him, uh, he began to fail and his body wore down. Uh, I'm amazed at the example that my mother set at taking care of him um, and how dedicated she was to him. I saw true love in all the hours and, and care she provided, and ultimately, uh, Harvey knew that the smartest decision he ever made was asking Barbara Little to marry him. Finally, on, on June 13th this year, uh, my father died peacefully in his home, surrounded by his family. Trying to summarize who Harvey was is impossible, 
He was many different things to many different people at many different times. He was a naval officer, a devoted husband, a loving if demanding father, a charming salesman, a dedicated teacher, and he was an incredible grandfather. I would invite at the end when you want to look at pictures, I have a some of I have a laminated sheet that has a bunch of quotes that my father kept on his desk at his workspace. Truly varied and wild quotes um, from all sorts of different sources. But I think you really get a sense of who my dad was and what was important to him. So I invite you to take a look at that. See, see what Harvey read when he was looking for a compass and he was looking for some words of inspiration. Using common measures of success, fame or fortune or academic degrees, Harvey was fairly ordinary. However, I think there are more meaningful yardsticks for lifetime achievements. For me, my father was extraordinary in much more meaningful and important ways. He made the world a better place by serving others. Whether he was serving his country in the Navy or serving the kids he was teaching while he was uh, working as, as a teacher, uh, that was important and he served. He gave his kids unconditional love and support. He was a dedicated husband who was always willing to put his own needs second to what his partner and family needed. I can only hope to come close to his example and provide the same kind of love and support to my own children. I was incredibly lucky to be his son and benefit from his teaching and sacrifice and I am thankful for all he gave and taught me. Thank you for listening, and thank you for helping me honor his memory. Wow. And now I invite daughter Mary Jane, who also has some thoughts to share with us. Hi, I know it's hard to hear, so I'll try and lean forward a little bit. Um, my name is Mary Jane and I'm Harvey's daughter. And I wanted to share just a few memories of my dad that I hope helped paint a picture of who he was. Um, the first memory I don't actually remember because I was only five, but it's been told to me. Um, I was really shy as a child and I was very scared about starting kindergarten. And my dad understood how nervous I was. And so what he did was he got the idea to ask the school who they used for their bus company. And he asked the bus company if he could bring me there to get onto a bus when nobody else was there, when it was just quiet, so that I could experience that when it wasn't so overwhelming. And I think that really highlights my dad's remarkable ability to put himself in the shoes of a child especially and understand how overwhelming the world could feel sometimes. And he was very compassionate. That was one of the ways he showed his love for me. As I got into my teen years, his way of showing his love usually took the form of lessons he wanted to impart to help me in life. I remember one time when I was getting ready to go off to college, he sat me down at the dining room table. Mary Jane, he said, I have something important I need to talk to you about, which was undoubtedly met with the kind of eye rolling and dramatic sighing that parents of teenagers know all too well. Um, but he took out a yellow legal pad, a black pen, a red pen, and a ruler. And I didn't know where this was going, but it didn't bode well for me. But when he started making these charts and visual displays, but um, he drew a long line across the piece of paper and he divided it into segments. And he said, this is your life, Mary Jane. I'm, this line is your life. And this part here, and he made little red marks from 18 to 22, this is where you're gonna be in college. And this seems like it's gonna be a really long time for you right now, but it's really short. And it's also really, really important because what you do during these four years is gonna have a big impact on the whole rest of your life. So when you're at college, I want you to remember that. And he said, I want you to, um, you know, when you have a decision whether you wanna to go to the party with your friends and blow off your studying for your test or 
you know, making the other choice. He's like, you're free to make whatever choice you want, but I just want you to know, you know, how this will impact you. And, you know, I'm sure it wasn't a well-received lecture by me at the time as 18-year-old me, but I know that that was his way of showing his love for me. Um, luckily, my dad wasn't always making educational graphs and diagrams and delivering life lessons. When he got to be a grandparent, he was able to let go of the responsibilities of parenting and let his relaxed, silly, fun-loving side show. My strict, regimented dad threw himself wholeheartedly into the joys of grandparenting when he became Poppy, as his six grandkids and the rest of us started calling him. Poppy was always there for his grandchildren, and unlike many adults, he really and truly took the time to listen to them and understand how they were feeling. And he again was able to draw on his remarkable ability to understand what children feel. His empathy and love for them were always on full display. He also showed a lot more of his silly side when he became a poppy. When they were little, he would sing songs very much off key to make them laugh at him. And then if they wouldn't go to bed at night, he would threaten to lullaby them. <laughs> and he would start clearing his throat and doing vocal exercises really loudly, very off tune. And the kids would laugh and laugh and say, Poppy, stop it, we're going to bed, we're going to bed. And they would run into bed. And he was just really great in injecting humor and turning a potential battle into cooperation with silliness and love. That was who he was as a Poppy. And when the boys started watching Star Wars, Poppy sat with them watching those movies. And at one point, he turned to them and he said, you know, boys, you did, I didn't never told you this, but when I was younger, I used to be a Jedi. And I said, and they said, what are you talking about, Poppy? And he said, no, it's true. I never told you, but I went to the, to the Jedi Academy for college. And uh, I wasn't very good at it. But, and they'd laugh and laugh and say, Poppy, you're so silly. But the re relationship my dad had for the longest time in his lifetime was his marriage with my mother. And I'm convinced that when he met her on a blind date, he had to have realized how out of his league she was. But he must have been really charming because she became his wife and he spent all of his life loving her. They've had their trials and tribulations through the years, but one thing has always been certain, and that's how much he loved you. My dad was a beloved son, cousin, friend, husband, father, and a poppy. And all of us here who are fortunate enough to be loved by him will carry his memory with us forever. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. Alex, David, and Mary Jane. As I sat there listening to these incredible remarks and stories, I don't know how many of you have seen the play Hamilton, but one of the themes of Hamilton is how to pass on your legacy. And there's a verse that goes through the entire play from beginning to end. Who lives, who dies, who will tell your story? Who will keep your flame and who will remember your name? You're always gonna tell a story. You're going to keep his flame alive, and you will always remember his name. I would ask the family to please rise for a moment. El Molay Rachamim, Shochem Bam Romim, Hamitse Menucha Nakona, Tachat Kanfe Hashechina, the Malot Kedoshim Utahorim Kazoar, Orakia Masi Rim Et Nishmat Harvey Fink, Shahalach Li Olamo. El Mole Rachamim, O exalted, compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and the pure to the soul of Harvey Fink, who has gone unto his eternal home. O merciful one, we ask that he find perfect peace in your eternal embrace. May his soul be bound up in the bond of life. May he rest in peace. And as one united family, let us answer. Amen. And you may be seated for a moment. On the back of your pamphlets, the origins of our mourner's prayer 
okay, which is called the Kaddish and means holiness. The origins are very mysterious. Angels are said to have brought it down from heaven. It is the only prayer in our faith that has the power to link the living and the dead. But if you would look at the English translation of the mourner's prayer, there is absolutely no mention of death in the prayer. Therefore, it causes us to focus on the blessings of life, and Harvey Fink was a blessing in our lives. I would ask everyone to please rise, and those who can to please join me in our traditional mourner's prayer, the Kaddish. Yitkadal, the Yitkadash, Shemei Rabbah. Biomad di vrach irute, biamlich machute. Bechayichon, ubiomechon, ubchaye de chol beit Yisrael, bagala ubizman koriv, bimru amen. Yehesh me rabba mavorach li olam olame omaya. Yit borach vi yishtabach, vi yit poar vi yit roman vi yit nase. Vi yit adar vi yit alev yit alal. Shemei te kudusha berichu leela min kol berchata v'shirata tush berchata v'nechemata da miran bioma mimru amen yehi shlama raba min shemaya v'chayim olenu v'al kol yisrael bimru amen o ses shalom bimru mav hu ya ses shalom olenu v'al kol yisrael bimru amen may the good Lord who makes peace in the high heavens, grant peace and comfort to all of you who remember and who mourn Harvey Fink. And again, as one united family, let us answer. Amen. And you may be seated. Accept the family, please.